This is lecture six, and we will be covering how to uh, encode data such that it is insensitive to delay variation as a result of temperature and or process variation. Um, basically, these are delay insensitive encodings. So if we take a look at our handshake, we have the request rail and we have the enable rail. And there are a couple of places in which we can think about putting data. We can either put it on uh, the set phase of the request rail, in which case that data propagates forward with the request. Or we can put it on the reset phase of the request rail. Now it still propagates forward, but it doesn't happen in the set phase, it happens in the reset phase. Um, with PMOS rather than NMOS. We can put it in the uh, set phase of the enable, in which case the data actually steps backwards on each new request. It steps backwards one on each new request. Or we can put it in the reset phase of the enable. And it also steps backwards by one unit on each new request. In. When we're looking at delay and sensitive encodings, um, there are some restrictions. And so in a typical kind of binary encoding, you might have something like this, where you have four states, zero, one, two, and three. And you want to be able to get from any one state to any other state. The, in, let's say we're building a two-phase system, and so we have data on both the set phase and the reset phase of the request, right? A four phase system would have data only on one of the two phases. Well, we need to be able to get from one uh, state in the encoding to another, but we can't pass through any valid state. We only have one opportunity right here to switch the state. And during that opportunity, we can't pass through any other valid state of the encoding. And so there, we got two options, right? We have uh, this option in which we can go from zero to one, we can go from zero to two, but we can't go to, from zero to three because we're flipping two wires. And so if we try to go from zero to three, we'll end up going through some other valid state. So we raise, let's say we raise the left bit first, then we'll end up going through state two before we raise the right bit and go to state three. And that state two will be an instability, right? Because we're, we only have this transition to be able to switch state on. So there's a second alternative. We can use a gray code. And now we can get from zero to one, one to two, two to three, and three back to zero, but we can't go in between. We can't go from zero to two, and we can't go from one to three. And this is for the same problem, same reason. And so you could build a gray code two-phase counter and it work, would work just fine, right? Because you, you can only increment up or down by one each time. And so you would just be going around in a circle in this encoding. But let's say that you wanted to be able to jump from any one value to any other value. Let's say you're building an adder, in which case the output encoding needs to be able to take on any value after taking on any other previous value. This kind of encoding with a two-phase interaction won't work because of these restrictions. And so we have four phase encodings. So four-phase encodings have valid data only on either the set or reset, but not both. On the other phase, there is a special neutral state through which we can transition without causing instability. And so if we want to represent, again, four different values, we can use a one-hot encoding. It's also called one of four. 
Now you might have seen one of one encodings, you know, one of one channels that we've been using in our examples so far. Those are dataless because there's only one wire. Here we have four. And so we can represent zero, one, two, and three. But in order to go from zero to two, we must always transition through this neutral state. So we must lower the rightmost bit before raising the bit, uh, the third bit. But now we can do that transition in the neutral state in the reset phase of the handshake. And so we don't have to uh, worry about, all right, is there an instability jumping through this neutral phase, neutral state? And so we can think of like other, other M of N encodings, right? So if we have a two of four encoding, it turns out that there are five different neutral states, right? So we, if two bits are high representing a value, then zero, zero, one, one represents zero and zero, one, one, zero represents three. If we want to jump from zero to three, then we have to lower bit zero and then raise bit three or zero, one, two, bit two. And doing so moves us through the zero, zero, one, zero neutral state. And so when we design our encodings, we have to make sure that either, if we're in a two-phase situation, that we can always get from one valid state to another without transitioning through a third. Or if we have four phase, that we can get from one valid state to another, only ever transitioning through a neutral state. So in general, if you look at kind of different measurements for how efficient these M of N encodings are, um, you can see that in general, uh, one of N encodings are relatively efficient in energy, right? Two of N encodings require an extra transition. Three of N require an extra transition on top of that because each new transition incurs an energy cost. However, the number of wires required for one of N encodings grows very quickly relative to M of N encodings, like four of N. So this means that if you want to build a, uh, an encoding that can transmit eight different values, maybe you want to think to avoid a one of N encoding. Then finally, the transistors, the number of transistors required to represent these encodings actually grow exponentially. And so in general, you want to stay down by around one of three tends to be actually the optimal for the total trans total number of bits uh, communicated versus transistor count and total number of bits communicated versus energy uh, and total number of bits uh, communicated versus number of wires. One of three is the optimal, oddly enough. So let's take a look at an example. We're going to build a four phase one of two WCHB. So one of two has two valid states, uh, zero one representing the, the integer value zero and one zero representing the integer value one. And then it has a single neutral state zero zero uh, through which we can pass in the reset phase of the WCHB handshake. So here's our existing WCHB uh, pipeline stage that we derived in lecture three. And we're gonna start modifying this to implement uh, a one of two delay insensitive encoding. So notice we have our request rail, LR and RR. And so if we go back and look at our one of two encoding, we're sticking the, this encoding on top of our request line. And this encoding has two wires, which means that we're going to have two request lines, one for true and one for false. So we're going to want to add a request line for false. 
enter. Right? So when we add this request line, it's going to look very similar to our original handshake, our original WCHP circuit. We're going to have an input request rail, LF or LT. They're mutually exclusive. That's guaranteed by the encoding. They're each going to be passed into this C element, right? Either one down here or one up here, which has the same handshake uh, dictated by the enable on the output, right? So we don't want to send either uh, output request until the enable on the output is ready. And then we need to do something about the input enable. And so we get a request on LF. And we know that when we set the output request high, then we can set the input enable low. Well, now we need to be able to do that for either input request. If an input request comes in on either side, then we need to set the input enable low. And so we can use a NOR gate for that. All right, so a NOR gate is if either request is high, then we set it low, then we set the input enable low. And we're left with our production rules for this WCHB encoding, for this WCHB one or two four phase encoding. So we have effectively replicated the request rail side of the WCHB for our one of two. Now, if we were to do one of three, we'd do the same thing. We'd create a new C element for our new request rail, and we'd, we'd wire it into the input enable once again, and it would implement mutual, mutual exclusivity, assuming the input requests are already mutually exclusive. And so if we wanna kind of start from our production rules and derive the CHP again, we can start doing that. So we can take our production rules and build out the HSC, right? And so this, if we look back at our production rules here, we have RE and LF, RF up, or RE and LT, RT up. These are conditional, they're separate states. They can't, they don't happen in parallel. And so we use a selection statement. We wait for RE, and then if LF is high, we raise R. If LT is high, we raise RT. If neither are high, we wait for one to go high. After that's done, we lower the input enable, and then we go into the reset phase of our handshake. Now in the reset phase, only one of the output requests is currently high. And so we wait for our, for our output enable to go low. And then one of LF or LT is already low. All right, let's say our LT went high, RT, RT went high. Now we're here, LF is currently low. RF is currently already low as well. And so this whole branch of the parallel split is vacuous. It's already happened. And so the only thing that matters then is this branch of the parallel split where we're waiting for LT to go low before resetting RT. And then once the reset phase is done, we raise LE again to say, hey, we're ready for our next bit of data. And so we can factor out uh, the operations on L and the operations on R into channel commands. So let's take a look at the operations. So we talked about deterministic selection. We're waiting for any one condition to be true, and then we execute the associated action. We're going to factor out the operations on L into a channel communication action, right? So a receive on L. So we're going to take notice. Here's the normal handshake that you'd see on a channel. Wait for the input request, lower the input enable, wait for the reset of the input request, 
raise the input enable. So we can factor that out into a receive on L into the variable X. And now wherever we read the input data, we can just use X. Then we can do the same thing for R. So we take all the transitions in R and we're saying, wait for the output enable, raise the output request, wait for the reset of the output enable, lower the output request. The only difference from our usual handshake on a channel receive is that we're actually reading the value of this internal variable in order to copy it out onto the output request variables. If we didn't have data, we wouldn't need to do this. And so we can take this and turn it into a normal channel receive using, or channel send using app. And we have our CHP for the four phase one of two WCHP. Now this CHP doesn't actually specify the encoding. It doesn't specify how many states there are in the encoding. It doesn't make any indication of what kind of data you're sending over the channel. So you've lost that information. It also means that if you're going from CHP down to production roles, then this is an opportunity to make that decision. So we receive X from L, and then we send X on R, and we repeat. Is it possible to represent the either the encoding of X or something about X's structure within the CHP. So not necessarily that you were uh, choosing a one of two uh, data presentation encoding, but that X was going to be a word length of a certain size. So generally in control flow languages like this, that kind of information comes about as a result of the typing system, right? So if you have a type system that allows you to declare X as an int 64, that would be where you get that information. Okay. But CHP by default doesn't have a type system. Mm -hmm. You can build a CHP simulator that in which you kind of uh, bolt on a type system on top of the CHP. So ACT can simulate CHP to a limited extent at the moment. Um, and you can use, it has a, a set of types, some that have um, word length information and some that don't. And so you can use, I think ACT has a typing system you can use to do that. Okay. But within CHP itself? Within the variables are? Okay. Right. Within the base specification of CHP, variables are untyped. Mm -hmm. When we extracted the uh, left receive rule from the production rules, or from the uh, handshake rules, in the set uh, transitions, we kept uh, a read of the value of X to determine whether we were going to transition RF or RT to go high. Mm -hmm. And then the reset, we just, um, for instance, we're no longer waiting on uh, an L value, we just lose them entirely. Yes. Because this isn't about communicating data, this is about the handshake or shuffling. Okay. This is about the, the synchronization between L and R. Mm -hmm. So since Okay, we also lose the uh, L enable down. Yes, okay. 
notice that this internal variable also has a delayed and sensitive encoding. And so any time that you want to save or communicate data, the encoding has to be delayed and sensitive. Okay. Because it's not it's not just channel operations on which you're communicating data. In effect, valid states not they don't just communicate the data, they also communicate the fact that they are valid. Right? So we go back to look at what an encoding looks like. You can tell from just the information in the encoded in the wires here that this is a valid state or this is a neutral state. Right? If there is a rail that is high, it is a valid state. If there aren't any, then it's a neutral state. If we go back here and we look at these neutral states, if there are two rails that are high, it's a valid state. If there are one or zero rails high, then it's a neutral state. Mm -hmm. Right, so the validity of the data is encoded alongside the data. Yes, okay, so you're not, you're not representing. I'd say there should not be any downstream transitions which have as their upstream an invalid uh, data encoding. Correct. And moreover, there shouldn't be any downstream transitions which could ever be triggered by invalid data encoding. So if in our one of two, if both wires go high, then that is it both it both happen to go high. There shouldn't be anything on our right hand side. There shouldn't be any right hand side of any of the rules which are uh, susceptible to being act activated by that left hand side. No, we we assume that the uh, the people the processes that we're communicating with will um, will correctly follow the protocol. And so we assume that they won't go into that one one illegal state, okay. which means that our circuit is prone to failure if they do. Now, if you're dealing with, say, radiation, and you can get a single event upset, which raises one of the rails and sends you into an illegal state, then maybe you want to build your circuit so that if it is an illegal state, it doesn't proceed until it's out of that illegal state. That's one way to radiation harden the cell time circuit. Um, that, of course, requires more transistors um, and more overhead. It's because our reset enable in the case where it has to engage with, has to accommodate potentially adversarial states, couldn't just be a door of the inputs. Right. Instead, it would have to be uh, a sealment of some kind because it has to be state holding, it has to hold the last state over in the illegal state. And also, we can't forward that illegal state on RF. So there has to be some communication basically some kind of uh you'd have to put a, a, a an arbiter mutual exclusion element uh between the two rails here and so it gets a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. and we'll get into what an arbiter is in later lectures that's i believe in module four No other questions at this time. Okay. Let's get into some examples.
So we are in lecture six. And we open up the Broccoli Timeline interface. And let's take a look at what we've, what we've got. So we have two examples. In example one, our goal is to build a weak condition hat buffer. Uh, with a four phase one of two encoded. Remember to reset all of your C elements uh, properly. And notice that we are using an E one of two, and we've got these brackets around it, the, the corner brackets. Now, much like there is templating in C++, ACT allows you to template processes and channel descriptions. And so if we look at channel.act, we've got this export template with a parameter type pint, right? It's only valid for parameterized code or in order to parameterize code, code uh, with n being the number of rails and or the number of states. In this case, because it's a one of n, it's the same. Uh, and the name of the channel is an e one of. And it has n data rails. So instead of f or t, you use r dot d with an array, zero. r dot d one, right? Uh, and then we have our enable. If we look at uh, our make file, it looks the same. We compile E1, we compile the analog simulation for E1. And if we look at our, our C file, again, we just deal with reset and then advance 100. And so for this first example, everything that you need to know is in E1.act and channel.act. So, so to walk through, the WCHB, we start with our uh, output request. So we start with R.E and L.D0. Uh, because uh, you know, just like when we're implementing request rails for previous designs, we need the inverting sense. So we use underscore R.D0 down. Do the same thing for R.D1. Duplicate LD1, RD1, right? And that implements the two sides of the uh, the two different C elements, right? So the the pull down for the internal node of C element one, pull down for the internal node of C element two. Then we need the inverters, right? So now for RD0, RD0 up. So that's driving the false rail here. We can replicate that for the true rail. And then we need to handle the set phase of the input enable. So we say RFD0 or RFD1. If either of those go high, then lower the input enable. Now we need to do the reset phase of the handshake expansion. So we say not RFD and not L.D0. Just like in the reset phase of a normal WCHB, underscore RD zero up. We can replicate that for the true rail. One and one. And then we need the output inverters. Right? So underscore RD zero, RFD zero down. We can replicate that for the true rail. Okay. So now we have our handshake. We need to reset rules. So much like in the dataless WCHB, we want to reset the output request rails low, which means that we want to prevent these rules from firing. And so we use g dot underscore s reset and to guard against the reset phase, g dot underscore s reset and 
It's replicated across both request rails. And then in order to force these rules to fire, we need to use G dot, we use not G dot underscore S reset or just like in the, in the data list WCHP. And so there is our WCHP with data. I forgot to include my reset phase of L.E. So we need on the reset phase, not R.D0 and not R.D1. When they're both low, L.E goes high. Now it goes high sometimes. Okay, so let's take a look at the analog simulation. We're going to say PRSIM in V.PRS, source PRSIM.RC. Now let's take a look. PRU test.spy.prn. And we have LD0, LD1, LE, RD0, RD1, RE. And you can see our random timing has produced also random input requests. What generates the names? Why does it become R underscore AD underscore 50? Uh, in order for Spice to understand, understand the name of the signal, we need to uh, mangle it. And so dots become underscore A. Uh, open brackets become underscore 5. Close brackets become underscore six. It's just the style of the mangling okay. algorithm used in ACT in order to make it support spice. Okay, makes sense. Um, so if I had done more work on the waveform viewer, then I would be demangling the names before. Mm -hmm. So we can see we have uh, a request on R1 and a request on R1. On L2, and then request on L1, and then request on L2, but it all produces. If you scroll down your waveform list. So if I look at the signals you mean? Mm -hmm. And then scroll all the way down. So the V uh, X dot number, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That is underscore list. RD. Oh, okay. And so I can put that here, and I can put this here, and you can see that's the internal node of the CLN. Mm -hmm. But so why do we have 10, 15, 16, 17, so on and so forth? Why are so many of them generated? Uh, those are all uh, nodes between sequentially connected transistors in the PMOS and NMOS stacks. Okay. And so sometimes uh, you can get those nodes charged in a weird way that propagates out and creates a glitch. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's important to be able to look at those and make sure that's not happening. Okay, I'm just kind of curious what it's, where in the circuit those would be that they're showing us uh, since they're not. So if you were to look at the pull up and pull down stack of the C element, mm -hmm. you have four transistors, two PMOS, two NMOS. Mm -hmm. And so in between the first two PMOS is one of those nodes. Okay. In between the, the two NMOS is another one of those nodes. Okay. And so there's two in here. There's two in here. There is one in here. And there are likely more in the um, weak feedback inverter. Okay, so this is something which 
has been generated by actually so at what point are those intermediary nodes generated to then be sampled for the signal is that done during the digital uh, simulation behind the scenes or this entirely analog it's simulation? An, it's an entirely analog simulation thing. Okay. So you only get them when you generate the spice netlist. So if we take a look at that, that spy, you'll start to see the number zero through nine star. You'll start to see all of those internal nodes. So if we open up example two, then our goal is to implement a one bit pre-charge half buffer for phase one of two. So it's the same problem, but we're just using TCHB reshuffling instead of WCHB reshuffling. Okay. And so feel free to use the example to build on the example from last time. So uh, for this example, I'm going to pull from our previous lecture. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to pull in this existing implementation of a dataless PCHB. Mm -hmm. Now, now that we have this implementation, we're going to need to adjust it for data. And so notice we we have this declaration from our um, problem specification, so we can remove this signal that it replaces. Now, if we look through this, the two things that need to be modified are the requests on L and the requests on R. So let's just take a look at underscore R R to begin with. We're going to need to duplicate any references to that. So duplicate that, underscore rd0, underscore rd1. And instead of l.r, it's going to be l.d0, l.d1. And then we have the forward driver. So we duplicate that, rd0, rd1, r.d0, r.d1. Now this is pretty much unchanged relative to our WCHB implementation. The same basic approach. Problem is when we get into here with LV. Notice we have L.R and R.R underscore LV down. There are two ways to go about this. Um, Notice that this is a uh, C element. And it's a C element with an inverter following it. And so that means that we can either just dump everything into the C element, right? So L.D0 or L.D1 and R.D0 or R.D1. Right, we can dump everything into that C element, or we can break this up a bit, and so we create an L dot D zero or L dot D one L valid down, or sorry, underscore L valid down R dot D zero or R dot D one underscore r valid down. So now we have our two signals and it replaces this. And then we do not underscore l valid and not underscore r valid. We can do r l r valid plus and then l r valid goes into l dot e down for our c element. Okay, so we're introducing that they're uh, we're splitting up the gate. Yes. Yeah. So we'll have to also change our error declarations. And so okay. this makes the transistor tax here smaller. 
not necessarily shorter. Turns out that this implementation is worse for this particular application, but if you want to fit more logic, it helps you do that. So if you're having trouble with transistors, stack size here, this can help you reduce that problem. Now, because it is worse, we're gonna go with the first approach. So we're gonna back up to that first approach. And I'll show you the office, the reset side as well. So we're just going with this, right? Uh, we have our C element on the enables, that remains unchanged. Then we have our rules driving underscore RR. Right? So we need to duplicate these, underscore RD0, underscore RD1. And then we need to duplicate the output inverters. So underscore RD0, underscore RD1. R dot D zero, R dot D one. Now we're getting into the reset reset phase with LV. Now the reset phase, again, this becomes not L dot D zero and not L dot D one, and not R dot D zero and not R dot D one. I was wrong. It's not worse to do the other approach because we get this stack length of four. Right, and so this, because it is PMOS especially, is really slow. Okay. So this is one approach to do it. And notice the resets haven't changed. Right, we're resetting the same rules. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, LV driving alpha E down. Mm -hmm. and, all, and not LV driving all that E up. Yep. And those are still single, uh, any other single. Yep. Okay. And so we can run this and I can show you this internal node underscore LV as it gets transitioned up and it is ugly. So let's do that. And let's skip the digital simulation. Actually, let's run the digital simulation real quick just to verify E2.PRS. Since I messed up the last one, source e2.rc, source e2.rc, cycle, and it runs. Okay, let's take a look at the analog simulation. PRSN bnb.prs, source prsn.rc. PR view test that slide that PRN. Let's take a look at this internal signal. So we have L dot D zero, L dot D one, L E, R dot D zero, R dot D one, R E. Then we have underscore enable. We have enable. We have underscore LV. We have LV. And that's all of our internal nodes. And so if we zoom in, This transition on underscore LV is horrible mm -hmm. because of that long MOS transistor stack. In general, three PMOS transistors is about as far as you want to go in a series, mm -hmm. and four NMOS transistors. If you want to deal with this, you can start sizing things up. But in general, sizing things up increases gate capacitance and actually slows things down on the inputs. So let's try the other approach. E2 dot 
So here we are. We've got our circuit. We're going to split up this LV. One for LV. And one for RV. And we're going to have underscore RV. And this is going to be not underscore LV and not underscore RV. And then when we go down here, we're going to split this up. And have LV. We're going to have RV. And then we're going to have underscore LV and underscore RV. But now we're, we've got a combinational gate for underscore LV and a combinational gate for underscore RV. And we're, we're only resetting one side of it. And so we don't want to reset these gates. Currently, we're resetting them high. And so we want to reset the next one low, right? Because we've got our state holding element in the next gate down, okay. which is for LZ. And so we're gonna we're gonna reset this g dot p reset four. Now we can still use p reset because we know r dot d zero and r dot d one will do both be low as a result of enable, which means underscore RV will be high. And that will block this rule. So we only need P reset here. Could you walk through that derivation one more time? I just for the last P reset. Yes. So, we know that we are resetting enable here and we're resetting enable here. So underscore enable goes high as a result of this rule and the downgoing rule for underscore enable is blocked. So that means that enable goes low if enable is low, both of these production rules will be disabled. Mm -hmm. And both of these production rules will be enabled, which in turn enables both of these production rules, driving both R.P0 and R.P1 low. Now, because they are both low, these production rules will be disabled for underscore RV. And this production rule will be enabled for underscore RV. So that means we know underscore RV will be high. So when we look at the rules for LV here and here, And we look at underscore RV, mm -hmm. we know this will disable this production rule. And so LV up will not fire during reset. Yep. But we also know that this production rule here may be disabled because we cannot guarantee the value on underscore LV. So we have to ensure that this production rule is driven mm -hmm. with a P reset. And that guarantees our value on L.E is set with some correct value. Doesn't it can be up or down, doesn't matter. In this case, it is up. Thank you. So that progression made sense. Okay. So now that we have all those new signals, let's rerun the calculation. Let's test the digital simulation.
Okay, digital simulation works. Let's go into the analog simulation. Okay, the analog simulation is completed. Let's take a look at our PRDU test test by FDRN. Now, we have LD0, LD1, LE, RD0, RD1, RE, and then we have underscore enable, enable, underscore LV, underscore RV, and LV. So you can see those transitions are much cleaner. Does that make sense? Let's go back to the uh, PRS rules just for a moment. Yes, we reduced it from a uh, conjunction of four different uh, signals to two conjunctions of two. Uh, the cost of an additional internal variable. And an extra transition, which means this costs more energy. Okay. More energy preparation, but faster. But yeah. uh, uh, any difference in terms of area of consumption? Yes, uh, increased area. Okay. Because when you build a sequence of transistors that is long, what you end up doing is you have your uh, source in your drain, and you, you have multiple gates in a row. So this is a lot smaller than two separate gates or three separate gates. Okay. All right. Make sense. Thank you.